Great. Thank you very much, um, Neil. Um, I was wondering how far we were going to get through the day without somebody saying, this is all irrelevant, because it's, you know, th I think that is one of the questions that we really want to tackle. Is Britishness a term? Is it an idea uh, that is actually pertinent, that we can actually work with at this stage, or do we need to move beyond it into something else? Um, we're going to be returning to that um, um, difficult and stupid question of, of, of why there being no great British artists for the um, panel discussion. But we're going to move along now to our, our third speaker this morning, who's uh, Craig Richardson, uh, artist, curator and writer, uh, and Professor of Fine Art at Northumbria University in Newcastle. So over to you, Craig. Okay, so um, thank you for this opportunity to discuss how British art has been perceived and understood over time, both at home and abroad, and leading to broader questions relating to British greatness and geography. Nicholas Pevsner described his 1955 Wreath Lecture on the Englishness of English Art as an experiment in what might be called the geography of art. Great Britain is the third most populated island in the world and surrounded by a thousand smaller British islands. Perhaps we can arrive at some, of the, some answers to the questions posed today, but also pose new questions by dealing with this geography. This is a, an important exercise, I think, today, but by undertaking it, I found myself writing things that I myself took issue with. And in fact, there are 18 question marks in my paper here, and the words if, perhaps, and but appear far too frequently to suggest that I have anything uh, like a, a definitive uh, offering. But I decided to override my initial resistance to what seemed to be an encouragement towards a, a broad over-definition of British visual cultures. However, regionally important museums and national institutions such as Tate by necessity must ask broad questions, you know, such broad questions, to figure out the rules of inclusion and then to formulate positive responses with an application to interested audiences. A collection such as Tate's is, after all, a portrait of a nation, and its rules of inclusion are analogous to that nation. So, Britishness, question mark. The term itself leads to other questions. If Britishness is a set of diverse national identities within a common sovereign alliance, then is the political vehicle still the United Kingdom? or something else. If Britishness distinguishes itself as a variety of customs, ideals, images, and ways of living, does it cohere towards distinctiveness only by being a living project and not a closed collection or a framework of restrictions? Or is Britishness now synonymous with heritage? In an international context, Britishness is a concept in flux, of course, is that because it can be adjusted to respond to official need? Has it been co-opted? Is it infinitely malleable as an idea? Or is it exhausted? Has the ship of Britishness run aground? The state would dearly love to apply values such as a commitment to tolerance and fair play, quoting Gordon Brown's 2004 British Council lecture, but such a commitment can just as easily be applied to corporate multinational tax avoidance schemes, as well as to the mutuality of a common ethos of our nation. At a national level, government would like to develop a British statement of values that sets out the ideals and principles that bind us. But does government have any idea as to how such a broadly based national debate could be conducted? Such a debate might have been possible in the emollient prosperity of the late 1990s, but we are now entering a new and divisive phase in our nation, are we not? As we speak, there is an air of endism surrounding the United Kingdom project. The instrumental power of the United Kingdom with its pursuit of common standards of public service delivery is now disputed. The fabric is becoming unseamed by tentative explorations of further regional and national devolution, not just in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, but also Cornwall, the north of England, and also here in London. So are we all in this together? Indeed, why stay together when the universalism upon which our welfare systems helped us all thrives 
thrive seems to be in retreat and whose last lost moral pursuit was the end of child poverty in our country. And then there are doubts about England too. By taking London out of the equation and pondering what England will become is now a melancholy thought. How to play the lucky coincidence that England is the native country of a global language and very much a living language, or how to deal with the continuing attraction to these shores of other less lucky peoples? These seem to be two vital questions national governance cannot adequately solve. Indeed, successive recent UK national governments have become quite mealy-mouthed and mean in these two respects. So all of these musings are, for me, the doubt-laden backdrop to the contestable question we are asked to think about this morning, the question of great British art and further doubts about that. So no doubt about it, doubt is the enemy of greatness. Okay, but let's think about these doubts now as questions posed and hence as constructive opportunities. British art is produced by artists in Britain some of whom have settled and become part of the cultures of place. Or, as in earlier periods, it's art produced for British patrons through a nexus of expatriates or British overseas connections. Of course, we must promote inclusivity in the 21st century and 21st century British art. The flexibility of professional travel is the norm. International interconnectedness, of course, for British art must continue home and away is the innately generative context for British art. Regionally speaking, we have supportive Scottish and Irish, Irish diasporic communities abroad. Meanwhile, a great number of artists from everywhere have based themselves in London and contributed immensely to its successful cosmopolitanism and its Britishness. But other than interconnectedness, broadly speaking, what can we point at and say that's Britishness in action. We're good at that, concurrent with others' perceptions. Well, Britishness includes a recognisably powerful visual culture that's known and acclaimed abroad for its spectrum of the highbrow to the lowbrow with the peaks at either end. This national visual culture, of course, includes the subject of so many state portraits, that is the Queen, in a central role as a cipher upon whom so much is projected. So what else do we do? Well, Britishness has a characteristic which has proven very useful when applied in the theatre of conflict, and that is a tendency towards intellectualised malevolence. The Brits play menace as self-conscious and as a willful experiment. We think of it as romantic because we play beastly nastiness as the flip side of our decency. James Bond and his licence to kill. Victor Frankenstein, ultimately more evil than his innocent monster. Meanwhile, Hollywood screen monsters have been brought to life by that same type of intellectual malevolence. It's Hannibal Lecter, played by Brian Cox and Anthony Hopkins, a distant echo of the English-born actor William Henry Pratt, who renamed himself Boris Karloff. We think we can tame and control this beast like H.G. Wells' Dr. Moreau. So Damien Hirst's The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living can be understood in this malevolent context. The tiger, the tiger shark is hardly indigenous to our shores, but Hirst's caged tank allows us to analyse unbidden horror and then to examine and convert it into some kind of safe or useful knowledge. So, <clears throat> given the magnitude and importance of some of these famous features of British visual culture, it seems odd asking why have there been no great British artists? There are many responses to that question, of course. Aristocracies produce a few great artworks. Democracies produce many small ones, to paraphrase the top will. Perhaps there are too many British artists, which would, which would suggest the self-repetition of Hamish Fulton or the constant media shifts of Richard Hamilton or, or Barry Flanagan are responses to the threat that the situation of too many artists poses to the idea of the artist as a special person. But British art as a typology 
is a difficult concept in our sovereign nation because we think we prefer the individual to have greater sovereignty than the mass. Over-identifying with the mass is considered potentially coercive. Hence, British art, unlike American art, is potentially a failed national project in the modern and especially in the contemporary period. Although not at all if you consider British art as a typology in which the primacy of the individual artist's project, Bacon and Hamilton Hepworth, matters more than the mythical story of the nation's art. Indeed, trying to define British art is a very British trait because we're good at bureaucracies of value and assessment. However, refusing to, de to provide definitive responses to bureaucracy is an even more British trait. And then there is the regional inflection. Regional identities often prevail over the national. Scots, we heard from Neil there, prefer a, prefer a differently located self-determination. So I, as a Scot, can say to a Brit, your idea of my region is my idea of my country. But all of this is just musing, because around the world, Britishness means Englishness. Sure, there are strong bonds and many similarities between the nations of Great Britain. England shares with Scotland a relatively homogenous ethnic population, but both of these people wish, I hope, that their received cultural identity would be better perceived as a palimpsest. And we each live with real and mythical landscapes and metropolitan centres with different political priorities and diverse industrial and educational structures. But asking a question concerning Great Britishness is really not a concern for Scotland or Wales or Ireland. It's an English concern, and I say that without any kind of judgment. Therefore, one can apply Englishness defined to Britishness, which is a reverse engineering of today's discussion and today's concept by having one of the regions define the totality. Now, Englishness is difficult to uh, define, and some commentators, such as Roger Scruton, believe it to have disappeared. But some have tried. Paul Langford's Englishness defined from 2000 attempted a definition of Englishness by its six chapter headings, which were energy, preserve, candor, decency, taciturnity, and that old chestnut, eccentricity. If Britishness, ergo Englishness, has characteristic traits, then these might have correlations in the, hel the elements that help make up the typology British art, that typology so full of so many individual artists' projects. So hence now, my outrageous deployment of these headings attached to some well-known British artworks. Energy. Preserve. Candor, now the top... The top left is Brian Hawes' protest, of course, appropriated by Wallinger and State Britain, the bottom left. So, candor at the top, decency, taciturnity, that's Ian Hammond Finlay's nuclear sale, and eccentricity, of course. And so, referring to Langford's headings, I deduced that British art does not suit greatness. Taciturnity or eccentricity doesn't fit well with greatness. But to ask the question is also a kind of odd thing to ask. Why is there no great British art? You may as well say, are artists appropriately candorous? You know, why are there no great taciturn British artists? But hold on. What is this to do with the geography of art? So I have a, a postscript response to the question. Does a metropolitan centre dominate British art? Well, one consequence of a dominant centre is that it may not comprehend the relationships which exist between regions, for example, a fructifying interregional and indeed internation relations between the realms of contemporary Scottish and Irish art. 
So these have the capacity to refute James Elkin's contentious essay for Circa, The State of Irish Art History, in which he suggested art history has developed regional and national strains that are measurably different from one another. Well, that may be so, but this methodology is centre-defined. The centre seems to want to measure difference when considering the regions, but the regions and countries may instead prefer to understand shared legacies. And one of these shared legacies, and shared too with England and Wales, is found in how artists and writers seek out the periphery as a response to this question of dominant centres. Artists and writers reach for geographic peripheries away from the centre, often in aid of an imagined authenticity. So perhaps great Britishness means metropolitan centres and coastal peripheries and how we move between. And the fact that we inhabit an island surrounded by islands has become an appropriate metaphor for a taciturn nation. And while an idea of endism leads to debates relating to the United Kingdom, perhaps this geography of a powerful centre or powerful centres surrounded by many edges is what binds Great Britain. And if so, this map of a centre and edgism is the important guide. Thank you.